Hello, everyone. Good morning, dear authors and invited guests. Welcome to Technical Session 4A. Myself, Vishita Soryan, and this session will be moderated by me. On behalf of Global Knowledge Research Foundation, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the English International Conference on Information and Communication Technology for Comparative Strategies, ICTCS 2023, Jaipur, India. The eighth edition of the conference is being held in, in an hybrid mode. The physical event is organized today in Jaipur, India, and the virtual event was held yesterday and is taking place today, that is 8th and 9th of December, 2023. I hope you all will enjoy the knowledgeable and interactive sessions through the day. In this session, we have 10 presentations. Each presenter will be given eight minutes for the presentations and two minutes for the question and answers. On seven minutes, I will raise a gentle reminder. There is another request to all the participants that you all stay connected with us till the closing remarks. If you have any query or update, then you can write it to me in the chat box. Just before we get started, I would like to introduce you all to the chair for this session. We have with us Professor Annie Ran Rajan, Associate Professor at Dhempe College, Goa, India. Professor Annie Rajan is pre presently working with Dhempe College of Arts and Science, Miramar, Goa, as an Associate Professor in the Department of Information Technology. She has been in the field of education for 18 years. Her special interest is in learning management system, tools for teaching and learning environment, her teaching as assignments. She's also interested to be an auditor for academic and higher education. We welcome you, ma'am. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, ma'am. Without further ado, we will now begin with our paper presentations. Our first presenter for this session, Sir Shashi Kant Srivasta, with his paper titled Architecture and Civil Engineering Applications of IoT. You may start with your presentation, sir. Uh, thank you, Vishita, and thank you for giving me opportunity. And I would like to share my uh, PowerPoint presentation. I hope I can do it, right? Yes, sir. Sure. Okay. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, the topic of my presentation is Architectural and Civil Engineering Applications of IoT. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, just to uh, brief in beginning, so this is how I'll be going ahead. What is, I'll be talking about my motivation. And then maybe, although everybody knows about IoT nowadays, so, but uh, I'll be briefing you about this particular topic also. And my, uh, in fact, uh, area of research is building applications of IoT. So that's what I'll be talking in a bit detail. And then I'll be talking about the challenges for building professionals and ultimately what is the future scope uh, for us. So just uh, to brief you all, uh, I'm a business researcher, so I'm from the management side, right? So uh, for me, the motivation is the uh, theory of management, which is social shaping of technology. So ultimately, any technology, in fact, when the technology comes to the society, so to some extent, uh, technology, in fact, uh, shape the society also. For example, the people who are using that particular technology, they make their particular group, right? So that's what, that's how they come together. So this is a, a foundational theory that I'll be taking uh, to understand the IoT and the architectural and civil engineering applications. So from here, I am, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, I'll be talking more about architectural and civil engineering shaping of the technology. For example, what uh, uh, I could see, which is happening, uh, is new building forms. Uh, I am perceiving that they will be generated. Then this will modify the existing spaces and maybe new services in architectural and civil engineering that will be, in fact, uh, come in picture. So with uh, this uh, motivation, in fact, let's see a little background of IoT. IoT, in fact, this term is coined in uh, 24 years ago in 1999 by Kevin Aston, right? And uh, just to elaborate on IoT, this is about every non-human object that is part of us on our day-to-day -day life. And then in the real world, in fact, IoT integrates uh, not only with us, but they, in fact, communicate to themselves also. For example, we can imagine that electrical fixtures, toilet fixtures, they are talking among them, themselves. So that's what is the complication that we are talking about. And although it was expected that by this time, 2023, there will be 30 billion objects uh, connected to the IoT. But actually, at the moment, it is not 30 billion, but 15 billion objects, they are connected. And uh, uh, just to note the complexity, 
this is uh, more than two times of the world population right so this is what is the scenario that uh, we are talking and just to brief you and this is for the uh, broader understanding so in fact iot and uh, which we call internet of thing is also connected with internet of everything and internet of nano things so which means the uh, origin of uh, the iot is quite large and if we call internet of everything so when we combine iot with the human beings and the work processes that's called what is ioe and then when we talk about internet of nano things so we are talking about the nano dimension which is 10 to the power minus 9 meter and then which tells us that every millimeter cube is can occupy a multiple sensors right and then, uh, in fact, if we are talking about sensors, so uh, if you are seeing the civil engineering application of these sensors, so identifying the strength, temperature, uh, ultraviolet detection, pollution, and in fact, many other uh, object, many other parameters can be sensed with the help of uh, IONT. Now, when we see about what is ha happening at the moment, uh, as far as building an IoT are concerned, so Microsoft and IBM, they are the, in fact, uh, torch holders for this particular scenario. And then they are, in fact, integrating with uh, many organizations which are involved in building construction, for example, Biko, Kimberly, Pone, and so on. And uh, in fact, IoT equip, uh, just to take a simple example, is IoT equipped parking spaces. So that uh, gives us in advance about the availability of parking spaces, right? And then uh, IoT is also applied on weather alert analytics. So a priori we can plan a multiple things. And similarly for security in the building. So what I perceive that going forward, uh, so security will no be more be a task of human being, but uh, this will be in fact taken care of completely by automation. So that's what is the broader context. And then there are some special human groups for whom uh, this is going to serve as a boon, right? And one of such uh, human groups are uh, a specialized group of people. So for disadvantageous group of the people, for example, patients, elderly people, children, and also disabled people, uh, this could serve uh, in a uh, much more beneficial way. So. Uh, because all these people, they require special attention by somebody else, some healthy individual. And uh, this attention, in fact, can be provided to them with IoT equipped environment and uh, objects. And they will censor, in fact, all the disadvantageous group and maybe whosoever is required to get the data of these particular groups that will be getting the data and they could take the decision based on that particular data. And similarly, if we talk about uh, the building and building materials, so for the time being, multiple nano building materials, some of them are being applied uh, in the building. Some of them are, in fact, they are in research phase and they are being applied. So you can imagine that uh, most of the, in fact, building problems that we face at the moment, uh, let's say this uh, is of a seepage problem, a structural problem, maybe fire problem, then the pollution problem. Uh, air pollution problem uh, i'm talking about the built spaces all those problems in fact uh, can be tracked at a nano level so that's what is the power that we have got when we integrate the iot with uh, the buildings and uh, going forward what uh, i imagine that the time is coming for cognitive building that means uh, now building they themselves will start thinking so if i'm talking about thinking that what i mean that buildings or building components, they will be in a uh, position of uh, taking decisions on their own, on their own. So without the intervention of the human being. So this is what is the context that I'm talking about. And for example, multiple things, they have already started uh, at the moment. Let's say about uh, automatic uh, switching of light uh, based on the, in fact, uh, outside human, which is available and uh, maybe cooling and heating all these applications they have already started but uh, what i foresee that uh, uh, the uh, we we at the moment are, are in a very beginning phase and a uh, most uh, complicated phase is still to come so uh, just to foresee the future buildings what will be the future buildings will be 
so few uh, in fact uh, things in the future buildings with, which will become uh, most advanced one is services in the building so services we know they play a critical role in any of the building and inclusion of the it in fact uh, will make these services even more complicated and uh, the future in fact uh, uh, aim of uh, the buildings uh, will become let's say if you talk about the fire fighting right so a lot of role will be of iot equipments and the data which is generated by iot equipments and what i foresee because my basic background is architectural so that's what gives me uh, some capability to think about the future buildings what i foresee that going forward buildings will be more mechanized uh, and we will be in fact devoid of the natural environment so artificially, uh, artificiality will dominate in designing the enclosed spaces and close, simple, flexible spaces in fact uh, will be in demand. That means space co configuration that the present architect at the moment is doing, maybe to some extent that will also change. Then artificial ventil uh, ventilation will be preferred compared to the natural and flexible spaces are capable of incorporating the innovative subsequent generation of equipment. That means maybe not uh, specialized spaces, but uh, flexible spaces which can be used for multiple purpose, they will be more in demand. And then the role of the architect is in fact going to change with uh, more and more IoT integration with the building spaces. So uh, now uh, what I foresee that uh, architects, they will not only be a designer, but uh, they have to play a role of in fact data engineer also because a lot of data is going to be generated. So how to use their data to take an architectural decision that is going to be uh, in forefront. So uh, if I talk about the challenges which uh, IoT integration with the building is going to pose to architects and the civil engineers. So in fact, uh, uh, theory of socio materiality, which suggests that even the uh, non-living material, they play a critical role in shaping the society. So that's what is going to happen in a big way and in fact, the biggest challenge will be how to understand this change. Uh, so that's going to, in fact, uh, be a challenge for uh, we architect and civil engineers. And uh, in this scenario, the technical challenges will also be, in fact, significant. For example, network of devices. So how this is going to be resolved and this is going to generate a humongous amount of data, how to use this data. And then this is not going to remain free with the uh, cyber security because ultimately when there is a data, so there is going to be a data breach. So how to take care of with the, that data breach that uh, will uh, be of concern. So hackers, in fact, they may hack these data and they may utilize the data for their own benefit. So how to deal with such scenario. So although uh, if you see the future scope, so uh, as far as comfort level, definitely IoT integration that is going to in fact uh, increase a lot. But then uh, if you ask me, then uh, what I foresee the data which is generated, so how to in fact quantify the data and use it for the benefit of the society. So in the present study, in fact, I have uh, tried to demonstrate the challenges uh, which a uh, designer and uh, uh, civil engineers, they are going to face and how their role is going to change. And few more management studies, uh, which I think uh, comes under uh, the scope, that is the adoption study can be done, how society is going to uh, adopt uh, this particular technology or maybe this change. And then uh, what are the various misperceptions which are associated and how to deal with such misperception. Then also one important point, because this is also going to change the aesthetics. So how to deal with it and to dig more upon it from a researcher point of it. And that's all from uh, my side. I hope I was on time. And now the session is open for question and answer. Yeah, thank you, sir, for your uh, viewpoints on, especially on architectural design and IoT. Uh, have you experiment on this? Uh, uh, Ma'am, I'm sorry. I think uh, uh, some at some part I missed your question. So maybe if you can repeat. Okay. Yeah, I can repeat. Uh, sir, you have given a good, um, you know, uh, insight into what the architectural design and how 
buildings are going to communicate to each other. I would like to know if you tried anything, any one part of it. Have you experimented? Uh, no, actually, see, uh, at the moment, I am in management uh, domain. So I am not in a technical hmm. domain. So that experiment definitely hmm. is not, uh, in fact, done by me. This is what I am foreseeing and this is what I am seeing is going to increase the scope of architects because they need to think okay. like a data but engineer have you, also. Have you seen, have you seen, okay, have you seen any building uh, implemented, implemented this? Have you observed anywhere? Uh, definitely. For example, lighting control uh, that's being implemented. So, mm, yes, in fact, yes. lighting with control. sensors, uh, we are uh, sensing the amount of light. Then, uh, next thing is, in fact, uh, uh, increasing or decreasing the, in fact, uh, air conditioning based on the number mm, of yes, people. Yes, that also we, are, yes, sure. Uh, but people would be is, more interested in security. Yeah, people will be more interested in security. So, uh, at the moment, on the research side, in fact, things are being done. For example, data is being captured in video, right? And the algorithms mm -hmm. are there, in fact, to see, uh, to observe uh, which uh, person is having a malintention, uh, mm -hmm. things like that uh, with the data algorithm. And maybe then that will decrease, in fact, uh, the role of uh, security personnel. Okay, uh, okay. Yeah. I think the observations are absolutely correct, but uh, uh, you can also include something experimental, which some some organization has implemented into their building, mm -hmm. and your mm -hmm. results will be much more better. Uh, right. Wish you best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. Very Thank much. you. We can go to the next person. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. We'll be proceeding ahead with our next presenter. I'd like to invite presenter Varsha Singh to present a paper titled Diabetes Prediction Using Classification Methods. You may start your presentation, ma'am. Hi, Ishita. So uh, I'll be presenting the paper. I'm one of the authors. Surely, surely, no issues. So, so uh, yeah, let me share my screen. All right. So please let me know once you can see it. Yes, it is visible. All right. So, uh, all right. Uh, good morning, panel. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so my name is Abhishek Karmaka, and I'm one of the authors of this paper titled as Diabetes Prediction Using Classification Methods. The other authors of this paper are um, Shari Kazi and Varsha Singh. So uh, first of all, I'm highly obliged that I've been given this opportunity to present this paper before you all. And um, thank you for that. So uh, without uh, much delay, let's just get started. So the paper that uh, I'm going to present today is Diabetes Prediction Using Classification Methods. And over here, there are 12 machine learning algorithms that has been experimented um, in order to look how uh, all of uh, different, different algorithms, machine learning algorithms work and uh, on the diabetes prediction. So the data set that we have used is Pima India Diabetes data set. So I'll be explaining each of them in, few, in a few more slides. So here comes the abstract. So... Uh, Whenever the body fails to produce a sufficient amount of insulin in a body, at that point of time, the sugar level in a body stream rises and it leads to chronic diseases. So it leads to a kidney problem, heart strokes, and uh, many more problems. Uh, and uh, diabetes are basically of two types, uh, which is type 1 and type 2, calling as like uh, insipidus and mellitus. In case of insipidus, um, with the urine, um, access of the, the glucose that, is, that gets passed out of urine, it's orderless. Whereas in case of milcipidus, uh, which is uh, type 2 diabetes data, uh, type 2 diabetes, on which uh, we have, uh, I'm presenting this paper currently. So uh, in this, uh, it, the urine actually uh, smells and it actually tastes a little sweeter. So because access of glucose gets uh, out of the body, so which makes the body more weaker. And uh, so that is the main issue. So uh, in our work, uh, I've presented uh, the work on uh, diabetes prediction and uh, which actually helps in making the improvement of the um, human lifestyle much better. And uh, our motive is to predict that outcome, whether the person will be having a diabetes or not having a diabetes based on few health parameters, which are um, blood level, glucose, insulin, uh, body mass index. And I'll be explaining each of these parameters in our next few slides. So skin thickness, uh, diabetes pedigree functions, number of pregnancies, age, so we are actually trying to achieve um, a goal, which is uh, predicting um, the person will be suffering from diabetes or not. So that's been used uh, for that. The data set that we have used is Pima India Diabetes data set. Uh, it's a militarist um, type of uh, 
diabetes and for that 12th machine learning algorithms has been used all right so here's the introduction so uh, a body needs glucose as its uh, prime source of energy now whenever there is excess of glucose inside a body and it, and there is not sufficient amount of insulin produced so excess of glucose never gets stored into the liver out of which uh, it uh, goes into the bloodstream and causes type 1 and type 2 among type 1 and type 2 type 2 is more dangerous uh, so mostly people of 30 years of age they suffer likely with uh, type 2 diabetes more compared to that of type 1 and uh, it's actually happening due to the day-to-day uh, -day lifestyle, gradual lifestyle changes. Uh, diabetes has become a um, common disease and uh, in that type 2 is a major problem. So, yeah. So, here's a target in our paper. So, uh, in our paper, we are trying to uh, predict the type 2 mili uh, diabetes mellitus using different machine learning algorithms, which uh, there are 12 of them, which are logistic regression, um, support vector machine, naive bias. K, K nearest neighbor, decision tree, random forest, gradient boosting, artificial neural network, Adaboost, logit boost, XG boost, and K means. So, and these have been evaluated using the accuracy, precision, recall, F1 score, support, ROC, and AFC values. So, here's a description of the data set. So, it's a Pima India diabetes data set. And uh, so, uh, this is a type 2 diabetes disorder data set. And uh, this has been collected. Uh, from uh, people living in Arizona. So uh, it's uh, like the area um, where uh, people from US and Mexico, both of them were there. And the parameters that has been found out, uh, like um, measured where uh, was uh, insulin, glucose, blood pressure level, number of pregnancies, skin thickness is basically the collagen content in our body. And uh, due to like a uh, person having diabetes, it varies. And the body mass index, which is the weight to the uh, height um, ratio square. And pedigree, uh, diabetes pedigree function is the likelihood that the person will be suffering from diabetes based on the person's history. So this data set, uh, this is a statistical description of the numerical data. And this data set consists of 268 diabetic record and 500 non-diabetic record. So 34.9% um, of person having diabetes and 65.1% uh, of people not having diabetes. So already the data is balanced, um, unbalanced. Balanced. Okay. All right. Uh, so here are a few bias um, in this data set. So um, these potential bias are likely uh, to be possible because uh, since it's uh, the data set has been collected from mainly in the past part of like US and Mexico. So um, due to it, there is already a geographical bias that has um, came into consideration. So um, since it doesn't contain the data set from different different regions of the world or for different regions of a particular country. Um, so um, that is the main problem with this data set that's already have a geographical bias. Second is the ethnic bias. Now the, uh, the population of whose this has been collected, this data set has been collected, belongs to an Pima tribe, which is an India uh, Indian population uh, ways back before. So uh, that ethnic group. So um, followed by the third, which is the potential outcome bias. Now the data set that has been collected, it only consists of 268 persons suffering from diabetes and 500 non-diabetic people. Now, even if we want to balance this data set, like 500 and 500 using any kind of machine learning algorithms, which are like uh, smart near miss, Tomkin links, or like any kind of overfitting, uh, we try to do it. Um, so in that case, what will happen is that uh, we don't have a real data set present. What we will be doing, we will be using different kind of... Um, um, fitting like interpolations in order to fit in order to find those data which can be um, a sample out of this whole population which will be fitting into uh, this uh, diabetes uh, diabetic uh, group and the fourth one is gender bias that uh, this data set uh, consists of uh, the data uh, like only for female patients only for females uh, who who are 21 years of age and suffering from type 2 uh, suffering or not suffering from type 2 uh, diabetic. So uh, it lacks the information of the male patients. Now the privacy concern of the data is, um, so uh, this data set is publicly available and uh, it has been um, used widely in research, but uh, none of the individual entities has been um, it is closed. So the individual and, um, identities has remained paramount. And also the ethnic group, um, the Pima tribe that has not been um, uh, taken like uh, they they has not been um, uh, taken out or uh, anything has been disclosed uh, anything of sort for them. So so here's the related works. So uh, in paper four, five, six, and seven, uh, 
uh, researchers had worked on uh, Bangladesh uh, diabetes uh, data set also in uh, China, um, Chinese uh, data set. Our main, main focus is on Pima India diabetes. So uh, the study, the papers uh, that has been considered, uh, these are uh, also the res uh, recent papers also and uh, the research that has been conducted um, six years before. So it's a mixture, and all the all of those studies has been taken uh, into consideration. So, uh, like uh, in the paper number eight, so they have implemented logistic vector um, support vector machine and KNN and decision tree random forest neural network. Another uh, study they had uh, presented, they have used logistic regression, SPM, KNN, decision random. So here the different different um, um, explorations uh, people researchers uh, had done and uh, in our case also we had uh, used many uh, machine learning algorithms and we also we had mainly stressed on bagging and boosting techniques um, so so here's our focus uh, so we actually performing a classification on uh, Pima diabetes data set and for this uh, precision recall f1 score uh, ROC and AFC values has been um, used for evaluation. And these are the two. So we have used a cluster of two. And uh, since uh, we, um, since uh, there are only two um, kind of class present in the data set, which is uh, type zero and type one, which means the person is not having diabetes as well as the person is having diabetes. So uh, a K-means clustering has also been and uh, for that, we have used uh, different pressing steps, which are handling the improp uh, improper data, balancing the data set, normalizing, splitting, and then finally training the model and finding out the best model out of it. So here's the outline of the overall methodology. So the data set, uh, this is the main data set. After that, we handle that outliers then, and then uh, normalize that. Then we split it uh, into training and testing, and then uh, find out the best model, and then uh, the model evaluation has been performed. So yes, uh, the handling them probably does it. Now, uh, when the raw data set has been taken, it has been found that there was no zero values present for glucose, blood pressure, skin thickness, and BMI. Now the point is, these cannot be zero. A person has to have uh, some amount of glucose in like a uh, millimole per liter. A person will have uh, blood pressure. It, uh, the person will be having skin thickness and BMI. These cannot be zero. So the first thing, the first initial step was to um, convert all the zero values for only for these particular columns uh, to be uh, NAN. So uh, these values has to be changed. Now, in order to fill that, we have considered the median. And for if a person for glucose and the person is not having diabetes it will be 107 and a person is if a person is having diabetes and for glucose it will be 140 so the median values for each particular class and for that particular health parameters uh, that has been found out and those nan values which uh, was like uh, like for insulin it's 374 so the nan values which uh, has to be filled we had filled them with median now in order to handle the outliers um interquartile range has been used so uh all of those um outliers that are present in the data uh so whatever values lies at the extremes of the 25th quarter minus 1.5 times of the interquartile range which is q1 minus 1.5 times of iqr those has been replaced with that of this value um q1 minus 1.5 times of um, iqr and those values which uh, lies at the extreme right. So uh, since these are the outliers, this has been uh, cut off and uh, it has been filled with the um, Q3 plus 1.5 times of IQR. So, uh, so here's the next step. So uh, now uh, since the data has been pre-processed well, so now we can start looking at the machine learning algorithms. So for that, we have first, um, normalize the data um, and then uh, we have also uh, like uh, divided into training and testing in order to handle uh, the imbalanced data so uh, in the training data itself uh, we have uh, used the smart process uh, which uh, interpolate and fills in uh, the values of the minor class to match with that of the major class so uh, after the data set, the training data set has been balanced. Now it has been used for model training. 
Now here the different uh, 12 uh, machine learning algorithms uh, that has been used. So the first is the naive bias. For that, three different uh, naive bias has been used. One is Gaussian, multinomial, and complement naive bias model for logistic regression Excuse support me, vector. Yes. Sorry. Yes. My sincere apologies, but I just wanted to remind you of the time limit. All right. So uh, here are the different um, uh, machine learning algorithms that has been used, and here are the different. Uh, so up after hyperparameter tuning, these are the parameters that has been found out. So uh, these are the models, and these are the hyperparameters. Now here is the result. So uh, out of all these, I could find that uh, gradient boosting has gave us a much better, like uh, the highest accuracy, ninety one point five five. And in case of the AUC, uh, uh, logit boost has. Uh, given us 0 0.90, the UC value. And here's the comparison. So uh, it could be find out for the gradient boosting, uh, 91.55, our, our work, uh, it has uh, shown the best result. So uh, it's a conclusion. So we have uh, tried to find out the type two, uh, the paper has been presented on the type two diabetes uh, prediction, and it has been seen that bagging and boosting technique has um, given much better result out of which uh, gradient posting has provided the best result. And this, um, for in case of future work, if a person wants to uh, do a prediction, uh, in that case, already Pima diabetes data set has been uh, taken. So we already have that for individuals belonging to US and Mexico. But if a real data comes from different, different area, uh, from different different country or for, or for, or from the same country but from different different states that can bring up a more robust model so yes so that was all about in this paper here the references and thank you yeah thank you Abhishek. Uh, you have told that uh, what data you said you have used is not real data set sorry am I right I'm, sorry ma'am I'm not like uh, whatever data whatever data set data yeah, data set what you have used is not a real data set. That's what you had told. No, no, it's a, no, no. Yeah, yes, yes, ma'am. So it's a real data set. Uh, what I'm saying is, if there are more real uh, data set, if it like a, a, if a person wants to uh, make it ro more robust, in that case, uh, mm -hmm. more real data can be added, and then the model can be trained. What was the what are the size of your data set? So it was a total consisting of uh, seven sixty eight samples. 768 samples and these yes. samples uh, uh, they had many entities with it or it was just yes so yes so uh, 768 samples and uh, it mainly uh, the people that were uh, for whom these uh, measurements has been taken belong to india um, so it's a pima tribe which uh, which mm -hmm. uh, like indian people only living there from from many years and it's in the borders of mexico and us so okay. and all of them and are you use yeah, and you use these algorithms. And why do you yes. think that gradient uh, gave you a better result? So basically, what was it's the a, difference? So, mm -hmm. yes. So uh, it's a boosting technique. So basically, all of those samples which failed uh, in the first mm -hmm. iteration, it actually uh, mm -hmm. had been given a second chance to train itself at the uh, second. Uh, so all the samples which are failing at the first time, they are given the second chance and they are learning again and again, uh, the model, the samples which are not been able to satisfy a certain condition, they are again given a chance. So, so which did, is you why... do a, did, yeah, did you do a test on X score? Yes, yes. The precision okay. uh, let me, yes, yes, uh, let me show it. So here. Yes. Hmm. Okay, fine, yeah. Okay, thank you. I think you should uh, do more work on this and uh, uh, get more data sets and uh, I don't know because area wise, uh, uh, the output will surely differ because of food habits, culture, and the lifestyle yes. what they lead. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Abhishek. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. We'll be proceeding with our next presenter. I'd like to invite Aminuddin Hassan to present the paper title Framework Digital Muhadat. Framework Model Development for Digital Arabic Language Learning. You may start with your presentation, sir. Do we have sir here, sir Aminuddin? It seems he's not there, so we'll be moving ahead with our next presenter. I'd like to invite presenter Muhammad Farhan to present the paper titled Digital Technology Skills for Professional Development, Insights into Quality Instruction Performance. You may start with your presentation. So 
सर मोहम्मद we once again do not have our presenter moving on once again to the next presenter karan chopra with his paper titled gesture based alphabet detection and scoring using open cv and tesseract ocr you may start yeah. with the presentation yeah you, we are on the fifth presenter am i right yes ma'am yes ma'am yeah, thank you thank you okay uh is my screen visible yes sir it is visible Okay yeah so uh, good morning everyone my name is Karan Chopra and uh, i'm going to uh, present a paper a presentation uh, about the topic gesture based alpha alphabet de uh, detection and scoring using open cv and tesseract ocr um so this is the abstract of the paper the paper presents a project that aims at improving the way in which uh, children between the age of 2 to 5 the, the initial learning years uh, they can learn alphabets the proposed solution uh, is a program with a simple and user friendly user interface uh, with an accurate scoring system uh, the project should appeal to children and make them help and make them uh, learn at the same time so using image detection technologies and gamification concepts uh, this project engages young learners in the alphabet learning process uh, the project gives an accuracy of 81.53% uh, which is related to the uh, accuracy of the pytesseract library which is one of the libraries used uh, so, so in the introduction uh, we can say that learning to recognize letters is a crucial ability for kids to attain uh, in their early years also gamification in the recent years has become a very uh, a concept where children can easily learn things through gamification so gamification for learning is a technique which uses gaming mechanics to enhance learning modern educators are progressively incorporating cutting edge digital technologies and strategies into their teaching methods in order to get better results from students so using these two concepts uh, i have tried to incorporate these two concepts into the program the application uses uh, computer vision and hand landmarks to allow children to draw letters of the alphabet in the air using their hands the letter that needs to be practiced is selected by clicking the appropriate the same letter on the keyboard the letter is then displayed on the screen in a box which will be shown in the next screen uh, the the children are then asked to draw the same letter replicate the same letter in a specific area provided and after they draw the system recognizes the letters using the ocr and uh, if the letter is correct uh, a, a specific sound is played and the score increases uh, so uh, yeah so it's in the literature review uh, sherin and uh, albrand they talk about augmented reality for gamification of the process of learning the alphabets uh, barata and others gamified information systems and computer engineering by incorporating a number of gaming elements into their course design uh saurabh udes sauji and uh, and others used numpy and open cv to draw in the air through gesture detection and fingerprint uh, fingerprint recognition so this is the proposed system and methodology methodology uh as i said the selected uh, a letter is selected by clicking the suitable key on the keyboard the user then draws the letter in the air uh, using uh, the real time test then uh, after drawing the user clicks the score button by simply hovering on it using the same two by the index fingers tesseract ocr detects the letter drawn and then the system checks if the letter selected from the keyboard and the letter drawn are the same if both the letters match the score is increased by 1 and the sound is played if both letters do not match the score remains the same and a different sound is played these are the libraries that i have used open cv uh for open cv media pipe this is this is this is for landmark detection uh, open cv is for uh, uh the entire computer vision process tesseract ocr is for detecting the letters and pi game is for multimedia uh, multimedia applications in the program so this is the initial screen so as you can see there are two uh, different modes the first is the drawing mode and the second is the erasing one so using two fingers using the first index the first and the second finger we can select between these two modes by using by uh, this is the scoring button where we can just hover on it and it can score this is the score it can display this is the the all all the alphabets the collection of all the all the alphabets uh, this is the display area for the character where if, for example if i click d d will be displayed here this is the, and this is the erasing option so as you can see from the index finger i can draw any specific letter the detected letter is uh, shown here 
um and with this and, and the erasing option can be used to erase the same letter now after drawing the letter so the detected letter was s what i uh, clicked from the from the keyboard s was uh, shown here now the user drew s on the uh, on the drawing area and hovered over the uh, the correction option so now if the letter was correct the score was increased by 1 and a uh, and a music was played these were the letters and the accuracy of each of those letters uh, that i uh, that i got from that so each letter was tried 10 times and uh, so for example h only was detected uh, 7 out of the 10 times and so on and so forth now the challenges faced by the application, the, the application does not well work well in low light conditions. It also depends on the resolution of your camera, of your, uh, of, of your system. The application does not have multiple colors. So for now it's just red, but yeah, multiple colors can be added. The application does not have a guidance system in place. So for example, maybe to trace it or to help students actually draw, it does not have a system in place. Uh, the user's hand starts to hurt if the application is used for longer durations because the hand is completely held in hair and in air and with no support. Uh, the application has trouble differentiating between characters like for example B and 8, D and 0 and all of that can be seen in the results. Uh, the application cannot handle variations in size and the drawing speed for different users. So these are the challenges faced and also part of the future scope where I well, I'll try to uh, address these challenges by making some modifications in the program. Uh, so in conclusion, the application combines gamification and computer vision to deliver a fun and engaging application for teaching the alphabet. The project gives an, as I said, the project gives an accuracy of 81.53%, which is related to the accuracy of the PyTesseract library. The project aims to improve early childhood education by providing a distinctive and enjoyable learning experience. Uh, these are the references. And yeah, uh, if there are any questions, I can answer them. Yeah, thank you, Karan. Can you please tell which algorithm they have actually looked into? Uh, which the, the literature review, the algorithms which she has used? No, not in literature review. Whatever you are using to detect the character. Uh, yeah, so the first is the, the PyTesseract OCR. What it does is it uses that image, converts it to grayscale, and then using a simple OCR application. So PyTesseract Pi is just a wrapper class. The actual uh, okay. program is Tesseract OCR. So it uses a simple okay. optical character recognition and then uh, detects the alphabet. Okay, so we cannot use any machine learning technique like, uh, for example, have a huge database and then try to work. Yeah, on that's a great question. Using... Actually, when I started off, uh, it was, mm -hmm. I was thought of using a machine learning algorithm. But then mm -hmm. after researching and everything, I found out about this specific library, PyTesseract. But as we speak now, but yeah, that was the first, that was the initial thought of using machine learning to uh, do that because that will give mm -hmm. us much greater accuracy. Yeah, because uh, as uh, students keep on practicing, yeah. you can uh, collect that data. Correct, correct. Yeah, yeah. Data. Yes, 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 mm, yes, yes. That's what. Yeah, but it's a good initiative, and uh, uh, you can really work on it and help. Uh, and I, also, the children who are with special needs. Yeah, it can help them if required. Yes, ma'am. Mm. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Karan. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. We have our next presenter, Maitri Vedya, uh, with the paper title, Implementing Power and Performance Optimization Techniques in Wireless SOC Design at Synthesis. You may start with your presentation, ma'am. Yes, I'll share my screen. Sure, ma'am. Yeah. Good morning to one and all. Um, I am Maitri Vedya. I'm representing COEP Technological University. I am here to present on the topic implementing power and performance optimization techniques on the wireless SOC design at Synthesis Stitch. This paper is uh, completely based on my learnings during my internship period. Uh, the other authors of the paper are uh, Vaishali Ingre and Vanita Agrawal from Electronics and Telecommunication Engineering Department, COEP Technological University. As per the agenda, we would go through introduction to the topic first, then followed by the techniques that I have used, the results, and further the conclusion. 
uh, as we all know, being an integrated circuit, an SOC is integrating all the necessary components of the electronic system into a single chip. And the industries are nowadays on the verge of reaching to the maximum limit of transistor scaling in order to obey the most law. And reducing this device scaling plays a crucial role as the integrated uh, integration, or we can say the low power designs on high frequency circuits are the need of the current period and will remain in future. And uh, this increased device scaling has led to the high leakage power and, uh, and the high frequency logics have led to high switching power. So this is all summing up to the high power dissipation in any design, in any VLSI design. So to uh, overcome such high power dissipations, various low power techniques uh, could be applied and uh, where uh, with the help of which uh, these kind of dissipations could be controlled. Uh, now, optimization is the process of iterating through the design such that uh, my uh, timing area and power are meeting uh, the targets that are being specified. So this paper focuses on the uh, optimization of power and performance at synthesis stage. Um, this, these experiments were carried out when I was working as an intern at NXP Semiconductors, and I was a part of synthesis and STA team in the back end. So my focus was completely on synthesis, but the optimization could be followed at uh, four different stages in a complete design flow, namely synthesis, floor planning, placement and route, and uh, clock resynthesis as well. But uh, during my uh, complete uh, internship period, I focused on synthesis. So I'm going to present uh, the optimization techniques and the results that I came across at the synthesis stage. Uh, if I were to define uh, synthesis, uh, okay, before that, uh, the optimize if I have to optimize the two aspects, that is power and performance, the threshold voltage is considered as an optimization factor. Now, if I have to, uh, if I were to define synthesis, I would say that it is basically combining my pre-existing components to, to form something new. Or I could say that it is a conversion, conversion of my idea into an implementation. But here in particular, we are going to talk about logic synthesis. It is a process where my HDL design is going to be converted into a technology specific gate level netlist for the particular set of constraints and the optimization settings that are being, um, that are being passed during the complete procedure. So the first technique that I used for, perform, uh, for the performance optimization was uh, the boundary optimization technique. Here in the diagram, it could be seen uh, that there are uh, it is the timing pa critical path that I have shown that I came across uh, while analyzing. So the boundary optimization basically has different types. Uh, those are mentioned in the diagram as well, such as constant propagation, unconnected pin propagations, and the complement propagations as well. So uh, by using boundary optimization, if in your path there is some kind of logic which could be optimized based on these three to four types, uh, the delay of this critical path was uh, by using this um, uh, types, the delay of the critical path was reduced by uh, by some amount uh, that is uh, with the help of uh, propagation constant across the hierarchies and propagation of the complement signals that is removing the not gate and directly connecting the input to the inverted input of the uh, flip flop which we uh, inverted output of the flip flop which is always available and then propagation of these equal and opposite informations and then removing all the unconnected pins that helped me reduce using the delay of my critical path and achieve uh, some of the, uh, to, uh, to move near to the target that was specified. The, another technique uh, that I used for power optimization was clock gating. Uh, there was a scenario in my design where, uh, where it could be seen from the figure that uh, the register bank was powered and uh, the register bank and the flip-flops were powered with the same clock and as it could be seen that if my enable signal is zero then the same value was to be fed back to the uh, register bank and that was unnecessarily uh, using too much of power so by adding a clock uh, by adding a gate at the register bank's clock net 
uh, as shown here. Uh, the clock gating helped me get rid of this feedback net and the multiplexer as well. And uh, by controlling this uh, clock signals at the register end, uh, uh, there was no need of loading this same value throughout uh, uh, the multiple cycles. And this helped me uh, save the unnecessary register activity and hence the power as well. But one of the conditions of using the uh, clock gating was that uh, if I have to introduce a clock, ga uh, clock gate in between the registers or in between the flip-flops or synchronous devices, they should be uh, clocked with the same clocks, that is synchronous load enable registers. This was the condition. Uh, talking about the results, um, the experiments, uh, as I already mentioned, that the threshold voltage was considered as an optimization factor here. So the experiments were based on the type of VD cells that were being used, and that had a great impact on power and performance as well. Um, the synthesis trials were carried out uh, by putting the uh, mentioned strategies into practice. Uh, the technology node that was used for the experiments was the 28 nanometer node, and um, and the design mainly had three clocks, uh, one of which was of 560, mega, um, 560 uh, megahertz of frequencies. And further, it was divided based on the uh, block functions requirement. Uh, to observe the trade-off between the uh, two uh, aspects, that is power and performance, the SVD and LVD cells uh, were used. As we all know that the cell propagation delay is directly proportional to the threshold voltage. So the LVT cells being low, lower threshold voltage cells, they were faster as compared to the standard voltage cells. So that could be easily seen from the graphs as well as from the, uh, the statistics, statistics that I mentioned here during my experiments. While using SVT cells, it was seen that my timing or the violation, the worst case violation was this 7.969 nanoseconds. And when I switched into from SVT to LVT, it was reduced to 3.409 uh, nanoseconds. But as you can see, if uh, the... Uh, the respective power in that case, the power was increased from 0 0.29 watts to directly to 1.49 watts. So here I could say that below threshold voltage, there will be some amount of current flowing, uh, flowing, which we call it as a threshold current, the sub-threshold current. But for LVT cells, a very small amount of threshold voltage is enough for any transistor to be turned on. And that is why... Um, at the same time, this LVT cells are becoming more leaky as the subthreshold leakage becomes very high. So hence the delay of the timing critical path could be reduced by introducing LVT cells. Uh, and But uh, at the same time, uh, it will be at the cost of the leakage power as it could be seen. And this trade-off between the power and performance can be, uh, uh, can be seen from uh, the graphs as well as it could, uh, you could see here that if when I am using SVT cells, my even if, if I am talking about timing, it is uh, giving good results, but in case of power, uh, the results, uh, results are getting worse if I am using LVT cells. So this trade-off needs to be balanced. And for this, in the future experiments, we, uh, we can explore the avenues for uh, the further optimization by considering the power efficiency into mind. Uh, one of the potential direction is to reduce the utilization of this LVT cells and the uh, reduction could be achieved if we are selectively uh, employing those LVT cells only into those uh, paths where the standard VT cells did not meet the required timing con con constraints. And consequently, uh, we would get an opportunity to develop the optimization algorithm, which is tailored to address uh, uh, this specific scenario. This could be considered as a future scope of the what all the learnings uh, that I have learned. And for the conclusion, I would say that uh, when I used LVT cells that improved my timing critical path, but at the same time, uh, my power, leakage power was worsened. And the worst negative slack was reduced uh, by some amount when I switched from SVT to LVT. And uh, the power eventually increased uh, with the specified numbers. So uh, the 
for the future experiments or the future scope we could uh, conclude it as we we could it, a design could be a multi vt design where in some logic wherever where i have to save power i could use svt cells and only on the timing critical parts i could use uh, the lvt cells so that the trade off between this power and performance is uh, it could be balanced and uh, that's all from my side um, at the end i would like to thank uh, icdcs for giving me this opportunity to present my learnings um, thank you you, yeah, you thank could you go ahead with the questions yeah thank you maitri uh, i would like to know where are the applications which area would you look applications for this cells uh, these uh, could be these cells could be actually uh, based on the design uh, at the initial phase of the design multiple experiments were carried out using uh, the those svt cells and lvt cells that as per the design requirements what all uh, target could be specified in in terms of timing and power as well so based on this multiple experiments it was decided that in terms of timing we could go with svt cells so basically the design uh, while designing a circuit uh, the it is it is said that it's good to use svt cells and only in the timing critical parts lvt cells could be included and yeah. this totally based is based on the uh, technology nodes that is being used okay but which, which are the real time applications uh actually this is a company specific information and uh, it could not be disclosed but this kind of circuits are uh, are application specific and the one which i was working for uh, was going to be used in the uh, e mobility sector okay okay yeah okay thank you thank you ma'am thank you presenter we will be moving ahead with our next presenter Presenter, I'd like to invite Sanyam Jain to present his paper titled Krushi Snehi, a web-based application for safe and smart farming. You may start with your presentation, sir. Thank you, Shiva. You're welcome. I think my presentation is visible. Yes, sir, it is visible. Uh, so, hello, everyone. So, I am Sam Jain. I am here to present a research on Krishisli, a web-based application for safe and smart farming. So it was done under the guidance of Sumaya Thasik, ma'am. Uh, so uh, talking about why actually it is needed. So uh, like there are many of the farmers who are uh, finding issues with uh, detecting the crop diseases today because there are many crop diseases which are uh, well known to them and uh, they are entering the markets and the farmers doesn't have a proper knowledge of what actually the crop disease is. And moreover, finding an optimal fertilizer for that crop disease is very necessary to save the crops from uh, getting defected. And uh, moreover, the uh, all the fertilizers which are moving on in this today's market are very much with the high chemicals and uh, uh, high amount of uh, acetic acids and uh, like some other chemicals which can affect also uh, the farmer's health. So we are focusing main on finding the optimal fertilizers and also giving a personalized uh, user manual for using that fertilizer to the former. So how actually we are doing it uh, firstly is because uh, we are just uh, detecting the crop disease. Then we are uh, uh, finding uh, the fertilizers which can be used for it and based on the uh, optimal fertilizers which we uh, recommend to the farmer, we will be uh, generating a uh, automated generated user manual using that and uh, whether uh, we are efficient yes we are efficient with an accuracy of 98.98 percent .98 in classifying around 38 different uh, uh, crop diseases which includes also healthy crops and also uh, crop disease so uh, talking about the aim we actually aim to find the crop diseases and finding an optimal fertilizers for it but instead of uh, like moving on for that, we are also uh, finding to get a user manual which can be personalized for the fertilizer particularly. And also we are, uh, for an additional uh, source, we are also uh, providing them with the schemes which are uh, like 
first uh, for now we are just focusing on the indian government schemes which are uh, given for the farmers so we are uh, actually uh, getting the details of the schemes from the indian government website and uh, uh, looking out in our uh, interface so that the farmers can uh, go through it and moreover we also have a translation tool device which can help the farmers to get uh, get to know about the schemes in the personalized language so which technologies actually we are using is uh, classification technique where we we are using the efficient net b5 model which is a pre-trained model and uh, for the interface we are using the react plus web scrapping and open ai api technologies so talking about the literature surveys, we have done around uh, more than 17 literature surveys. And here are the few. So the first literature survey, they have uh, done a classification of uh, crop diseases using DCNN model. And they have found an accuracy of 98.4% very much near to ours. And uh, the second was very much related to our paper, which uh, the second was Krishi Mitra. And they have done a uh, crop disease prediction detection and uh, also fertilizer recommendations. So we have more, uh, more further steps than this. And uh, the third was about a hybrid approach for detecting the crop diseases. So the methods actually we are using is web scrapping and for web scrapping, uh, the, uh, about the fert uh, fertilizers, we are using the Amazon websites because uh, we have gone through a, a money mint uh, survey where most of the people for the e-commerce website select Amazon as the best preferred website. So we are going uh, going with Amazon to finding a best uh, price for the fertilizer for the uh, farmers. And then for the classification, we have around 38 different crop disease classification. Uh, the data set size was around 70,000 images and it was, uh, it was uh, taken from the Kegel. And next we are using also OpenAI uh, API application for uh, getting a use, uh, specialized uh, user manual for the uh, fertilizer and moreover getting the fertilizer scheme which can be used uh, for detecting a, for like uh, curing a, a particular crop disease. Next, moving on to the web scrapping, we have also used web scrapping for the schemes website as uh, like I have already stated, we have used the Indian website uh, for getting these schemes. So we are using it and uh, uh, like getting all the uh, particular details like eligibility and what are the deadlines and all in our website. And also we have used the Google Translator tool for translating over uh, 130 different languages and 12 plus Indian languages specifically. So this is a workflow of complete our interface. So actually uh, it's a web application. So we have also uh, schemes, uh, schemes, uh, navigation here so uh, they can get a uh, government uh, from the government website what all the schemes are available for the farmers and next uh, they can also uh, change the uh, language of the website whenever they need using the google translator with uh, around 90 different uh, indian languages next for uh, testing the crop they can upload the image of the crop and uh, we are using the pre-trained uh, efficient net b5 model so it will just uh, uh, predict the crop disease and then we will get the crop disease label from that we also have a backend data set which contains the uh, symptoms and organic solutions for it so uh, to also take care of our environment uh, on the same hand and also we are uh, using a uh, we are fetching the fertilizers name from the open uh, ai to open ai api so we are getting the fertilizers name and then we are web scrapping from the amazon website we are getting the best fertilizer price product, like uh, maybe the deal of the deal, uh, no, sorry, day of the deal and uh, uh, the fertilizer, which is like very, very much low cost for the farmers. So uh, that we are getting it. And uh, we are also getting the details like name, price, rating, website URL. And uh, then for the user manual, we are uh, again using the OpenAI API tool. And we are getting the uh, different details like what are the chemicals which are present in it, procedure to uh, use these fertilizers, and the precaution measures the farmer should use while using it. So talking about the results, we have uh, we have uh, done around three epochs, and we have found that uh, in all the three epochs, like as the epochs goes increasing, uh, the 
accuracy of the of our model was increasing. So uh, as you can see here, the in the third epoch we have got the highest accuracy of uh, uh, ninety eight point nine five ninety eight percent. And also the uh, training and validation loss was decreasing during uh, each epoch. Next, talking, uh, talking about the other measures, we have also taken the F1 score and R2 score into consideration for our efficient net B5 model. And it was also a good score. Next, uh, talking about the interface which we have developed. So this is, the, uh, this is a sample uh, which we have got uh, for the peeper bell uh, bacteria spot. So it was a crop disease. So we have detected it. And uh, as you can see here, the symptoms and solutions, uh, these are from the, our backend database. And uh, these uh, in the down section, they are the fertilizers. So these fertilizers we have got from the Amazon website. We have subscribed it. We are uh, getting the ratings price. And uh, in the checkout, we are uh, redirecting the former to the uh, Amazon website. And uh, in the user manual, we will be just generating the user manual using the OpenAI application. In the conclusion, uh, we can say like we have uh, got a, a high accuracy of 98% for uh, 38 different uh, crop diseases. And we have also uh, generated a, a specific user manual, which was not uh, present in many of the research surveys, which we have done. And uh, many or uh, like all of the research surveys. And uh, next, talking about the future works, which uh, we will be uh, finding out mostly we will be uh, trying to also take into consideration the climate changes because uh, more than the uh, crop disease there will be some particular uh, conditions where we can use the fertilizers based on the climate uh, actually the farmer is growing that crop so we can also take that into consideration to give more personalized uh, fertilizers recommendation to them and moreover we are also uh, looking forward to increase our crop disease data set from 38 to uh, more numbers. And uh, moreover, we are also looking to get uh, more best deals for the farmers from the e-commerce website, uh, uh, from like other websites also. And there are some websites which are uh, particularly for fertilizers only. So we will be just uh, uh, trying to do it in the future works. And here are uh, some of the references from uh, for our paper. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm open for any queries or suggestions. Thanks, uh, Sayam. Uh, thank you. Okay, this is a good work. You have um, done a lot of, uh, I mean, a lot of integration here and there. But uh, when I look at the accuracy of 98.98, have you checked on what is your overfitting? Because getting something 98.98 sounds yes, to me as a researcher, there is a lot amount of overfitting somewhere. Have you checked that? Uh, no, ma'am. Actually, like we have used the images from both the, uh, like we have around uh, uh, two different folders for it, like trading and validation. So we have used the images from there only. And uh, moreover, we have not put our interface for testing. So uh, that was also uh, like mm -hmm. there we can't. Uh, because like, if anything is giving you that much of accuracy, Yes. That is really something what a researcher should think of. Yes. Am I really achieving it? Uh, and the second thing, uh, our farmers, are they very savvy with all these mechanisms what you are showing on the screen? That is also an important thing because... Yes, ma'am. Actually, like uh, the navigations which, here, uh, which we have introduced in our uh, interface, like uh, they are easy enough to follow up and uh, moreover like uh, they are just like few clicks after which the farmer can get all the details like they have to just uh, like add the okay, and when uh, when you're using a google translator have you actually checked have you seen at least one language whether it is translating correctly yes ma'am have you seen if there are some errors uh no, ma'am, actually, like... Uh... Yeah, so just check next time because yes, sure. when you're giving an information to a person and first time itself, it's given wrongly. I mean, Google is not giving you the highest level of translation. So if you're first time only giving a wrong information, then so once try your whole method using that. So you are saying that the farmer can see it in Gujarati, let us suppose. And yes. you have you checked really what is being read in Gujarati? 
this ma'am actually i have checked in hindi like it hindi, was ha. almost correct yes ma'am yeah so that almost Not also actually, you just check uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, because sure. uh, because what happens is if the farmer gets something wrong then uh, he will yeah. think that is right so that is what that is that's all okay thank you yes ma'am sure. thank you ma'am thank you presenter we have our next presenter I'd like to invite Abhishek Talawar to present his paper titled Recent Technological Developments in the Tourism Industry, a Bibliometric Analysis. You may start with your presentation, sir. Uh, good morning. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir, you are audible. Uh, is my screen visible? Not yet. Okay. It's not visible yet. Yes, it is visible now. Uh, very good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Abhishek Talawar, uh, a research scholar from the School of Humanities, Social Science and Management, NITK Suratkal. The title of my paper is Recent Technological Developments in the Tourism Industry, a Bibliometric Analysis. The contents of this presentation will cover the introduction, the literature review, the key literature reviews, the methodology applied in the study, uh, and a brief explanation of the main bibliometric information collected, uh, followed by the result and discussion, and finally the conclusion part. Coming to the introduction, uh, it is quoted that by Leeper that no matter why and where you travel, there is always something wonderful new to be found. And this is why humans are uh, natural travelers who are always eager to explore new destinations. When we talk about tourism, uh, it refers to people traveling from uh, different uh, locations for personal, leisure, and business activities. And tourism is a key, uh, vital, significant factor for a nation's GDP or a global GDP and also creates numeral employment opportunities. Uh, over the last two decades, globally, there has been a significant technological progress uh, from developing new computer systems and applications in various industries. Uh, and the technological breakthroughs in pro processing speed and hardware miniaturization has enabled the advancement of uh, immersive technologies, enabling users to experience new kinds of realities. Uh, and it has impacted not many industries, including the tourism and hospitality industry. Uh, so coming to the literature review part, so understanding the latest technology is crucial for the success in the constantly increasing global tourism sector. Uh, and there are key, uh, many uh, papers on the application of uh, AI, robotics, immersive technologies like uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, virtual tourism, and recently the applications of metaverse in uh, tourism research. Uh, furthermore, the application of uh, location-based services, the IoT, the blockchain technology, have resulted in an enhanced tourism experience that is more efficient, attractive, and inclusive. And it is also socially, economically, and environmentally sustainable. So due to all these technological developments, uh, the way people travel and how they plan for their travel has transformed due to these technological innovations. And these developments promise a far more engaging and interactive experiences for the people. Uh, Therefore, this study aims to uncover the current and emerging trends in the technological developments by looking at the uh, tourism uh, research literatures. Coming to the methodology part, uh, uh, in this study, we have applied the bibliometric analysis, which is a popular method for exploring uh, and analyzing large volumes of scientific method. It is usually uh, undertaken in the initial stage of the research uh, to understand the holistic picture of the area we are working into. Uh, uh, we have used the BiblioShiny tool, uh, which is an application in the bibliometric R software. So the data was collected from the Scoopers database by using Boolean operators uh, and the keywords technology and tourism. And the filters were applied to limit the uh, documents to the subject area of business management and accounting. And only research articles were considered in the English language for a period of 2018 to 2022. So this resulted in a final uh, uh, output of 1,430 uh, documents. So uh, this is a uh, uh, image of uh, showing the displaying the uh, 
main information of the bibli uh, bibliometric information collected from the Scopus database for the period of 2018 to 2022. Uh, from around 300 and different uh, journals or sources, the documents were collected, uh, uh, consisting of around 3,448 authors, and it had an accountant for 22.64 annual growth rate. And we can see that in the last five years, there has been a significant increasing trend in the number of articles published uh, in the tourism research area. Uh, this figure shows the top 10 publishing journal with African Journal of Hospitality, Tourism and Leisure ranked one with a total of 76 publications. And also these 10 journals accounted for almost one third of the total publications uh, uh, in this area, which is as per the Bradford's law. Uh, and to understand the most uh, productive authors in a, in a specific field, this is usually measured by the number of uh, documents published by the author and the total citations uh, uh, generated by the particular uh, article. So it was worth noting noting that the uh, author Law R, uh, Bohalis D and Gretzwell were the most productive auth authors in the last five years. And moreover, Tom and Bohalis were the most impactful authors in terms of the total citations as well. Uh, coming to the most global cited documents, uh, the article uh, titled The Virtual Reality Presence and Attitude Change uh, uh, by Tusadia Dai et al. 2018 received the highest global citation of four, 450 citations. The next is the three fields plot. Uh, this kind of analysis examines the interrelationship between uh, three distinct categories. Uh, in this study, we have compare the relationship between among the top 10 journals, keywords, and the country of origin. So it was found that the journals, namely Tourism Management, Current Issues in Tourism, African Journal of Hospitality, Tourism, and Leisure, uh, were associated with the popular keywords such as tourism, technology, uh, COVID-19, and many more. And the authors were originated from China, South Africa, and India. Uh, next is we analyzed the word clouds, uh, which shows the uh, frequently uh, co-occurring uh, words uh, that highlight the top topics within a specific field. And it is uh, it was relevant that uh, tourism is the most frequently occurring keyword, uh, and uh, other consistent such as tourism development, tourism behavior, and adoption, and etc. Uh, next, we did a, a multiple correspondent analysis uh, and a topic dendrogram. Uh, basically, it is used to detect the and represent the underlying structures in the data set, uh, which usually uh, visualizes two key pieces of information that are grouped together to indicate the similarity of topics in the group. So we can see that lead clusters mainly represent the uh, research uh, talking about the tourism services such as tourism, leisure industry, and the use of social media, and the developments of a smart city and the integration of mobile phone for tourism purposes. And the blue cluster focuses on the hospitality side, of specific to hospitality services with uh, keywords like hospital, hotel industry, hospitality uh, industry, artificial intelligence, robotics, and to improve the overall service quality. Uh, this is a thematic map which provides a, a, a picture of, of this and the uh, major themes uh, in four different quarters, like that as uh, niche themes, emerging or the decline themes, the basic themes and the motor themes. So here, the top right corner, the right uh, corner is called the motor themes, which has a high centrality and the density value, which signifies the themes that are well developed and crucial for structuring a, a research subject. Uh, uh, in this study, we found that uh, in the keywords such as tourist destination, tourism development, tourist behavior, uh, uh, innovation and the challenges due to COVID-19 were the uh, uh, major themes. Next, we apply the co-citation network of references, which analyzes the frequency in which two articles are cite each other's contribution, which shows the intellectual structure of the uh, entire study. So there were three distinct clusters form, uh, uh, which is represented in red, blue, and green color. The red color basic, the, red, the cluster one uh, talks about the theoretical foundations within the tourism research, which uh, talks about using the theory of planned behavior and the theory of user expectances of information technology to understand the 
uh, consumers' behavior towards this technology. And the cluster two talks about smart tourism, which is an uh, important constitute in developing smart cities and destination, which uh, talks about uh, using technology to access tourism and hospitality products and services and the experiences through ICT enabled tools. The cluster three uh, talks about the value addition of technologies. So the value addition of technologies in the tourism industry uh, is uh, can be seen by integrating social media, uh, uh, personalization, and the context-based marketing to ensure higher value to the stakeholders at the tourist destinations. So to conclude this, uh, uh, this study, this study analyzed around 1,430 journal articles published between 2018 to 2022 focusing on the technological developments and trends in the tourism research area. So uh, it was evident that understanding consumer experiences and the interaction with ICT tools would help, uh, will help in framing strategies for developing smart tourism initiatives. Furthermore, research on the use of big data, artificial intelligence and real-time consumer information can effectively improve service co-creation co in the tourism industry. So the outcome of this uh, study will provide valuable insight not only for uh, uh, in the tourism industry, but for the academicians, destination marketers to understand the, the current trends and the impact of technological advancements in the tourism industry. Thank you. Abhishek, uh, thank you. Uh, okay, so what we have done is just uh, read about so many papers and identified. Anything else new? I mean, Abhishek. Uh, actually, ma'am, uh, in bibliometric analysis, what it's basically for, if it's for a, a new researcher who wants to understand the who, where the uh, where that uh, particular area is headed. So, if you want to understand the which are the prominent journals, the prominent authors, the articles to look into, and to understand mm -hmm. what they are talking about. So, by conducting a bibliometric analysis, we can get a uh, we can understand which are the relevant themes uh, uh, that are happening in a particular field. But uh, nowhere it is said which techniques. Like in AI, there are so many techniques. Uh, not no, ma'am, actually, uh, the field, like we have said about uh, uh, use of AI, uh, the application of smart tourism, application in tourism. So it mm -hmm. just gives a holistic picture of mm -hmm. the uh, in the tourism research area. What is your domain area of work? What is your subject matter? Uh, actually, uh, uh, this paper or my work? Huh? Your, yours, yours. I'm actually uh, working you, on the... I'm are a you a computer scholar. science? Are you a computer science or are you into uh, from the social science back side? I'm from okay. management uh, department. Okay. Right? So I'm working on the applications of uh, VR uh, okay. in technology, how we can okay. integrate okay. this technology. Okay. okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Abhishek. Thank you, you ma'am. Thank you, sir. We have our next presenter, Ashwitha K, with the paper titled Understanding Wind Energy Generation Patterns, Storm Impact, and Animalist Events Using Machine Learning Techniques. You may start with your presentation. This is paper number nine, no? Yes, ma'am. Ashwita, if we have you here, it seems she is in present, so we'll go on with the next presenter. Nidhi Shivasta with the paper title, Website for NGOs Beyond Kind. You may start with your presentation, ma'am. Okay, can you just give me a second? So yeah, sure, sure, sure. Start sharing my screen? Yeah, sure. Uh, is my screen still visible? Yes, ma'am, it is visible. Okay, so I'll start. So good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce our project, Beyond Kind, a collaborative effort led by my team. I am Nidhi Srivastav, and together with my teammates, Ojas Matre and Atharva Suryavanshi, from the computer department at FCRIT Vashi, we are the authors of this initiative. So, uh, yes. Uh, this is the project outline and I'll begin with the abstract. So in the dynamic landscape 
of non-governmental organizations that is ngos where their pivotal role in addressing societal pol political environmental and humanitarian issues is undeniable a profound transformation has taken place over the past two decades the ngo sector has burgeoned into a vast industry comprising approximately 10 million entities worldwide however this impressive growth has not been without its challenges as some organization grapple with issues arising with the mismanagement of resources astonishingly a significant majority that is 73 percent of these ngos operate with only one or no paid staff exemplifying the resilience and commitment that characterize this sector so our project beyond kind finds its roots in the intricate dynamics of this vast industry as we navigate the complexities of approximately 1,50,000 NGOs in India, we are confronted with the sector that, despite its extensive reach, it continues to grapple with persistent challenges such as hunger and poverty. Despite the multitude of NGOs, not, not all operate at their maximum efficiency, it necess necessitizes a need for the project like we have created. Regrettably, instances exist where private NGOs prioritize government interests over the nation's betterment, urging a shift in the mindset. Moreover, while many NGOs maintain an individual website, there is an absence of a comprehensive platform that consolidates information on numerous NGOs. This has inspired us to develop beyond kind. Moving further, the aims and objectives of our project our primary aim with uh, beyond kind is to pioneer an inclusive website tailored with uh, tailored for under recognized ngos which are not known by enhancing their uh, visibility facilitating their funding and streamlining the entire management process bringing from donation to the end and upholding transparency we aspire to emerge these organizations to make a more significant impact in addressing the societal challenges. With this, we also plan to develop the website to launch a user friendly website that serves as a central hub for the these type of NGOs, offering a seamless experience for users and organizations alike. We also target awareness uh, that we need to create in the society to implement strategies to promote awareness about the showcased NGOs and uh, transparency, which will be the major aspect of our website. That is to implement robust measures to ensure transparency in the information that is presented on the website, fostering trust among users, donors, and the NGOs themselves. The scope is divided into three categories, beginning from the establishment of people's trust on donation, which is absolutely necessary. That is the primary objective, which is to instill confidence and trust among donors by ensuring complete transparency in the donation process. The website will incorporate secure and transparent uh, transaction mechanisms, providing donors with detailed information on how their contribu contributions are utilized by, by the NGOs as building trust is crucial for encouraging greater donations next is diversification in donation that is to offer a diverse range of options for people to contribute catering to various social causes or specific ngos of their choice the website will uh, the website will also take care about these issues next is promoting a clean and fair ecosystem to address the issue of dominance by a few highly funded NGOs, providing support to a smaller NGOs to prevent bankruptcy and foster a fair ecosystem. The website will act as a unifying platform, bringing together small scale NGOs under a common umbrella. This collective approach aims to provide them with increased visibility and resources, preventing the suppression of small scale NGOs, ensures a more equitable distribution of resources, fostering collaboration and synergy among organizations for a greater societal impact. This is the entire flow of our website wherein on successful login users are directed to the home page of the website and this home page showcases the website's mission and incorporates a visually appealing gallery featuring highlights from various events the navigation bar uh, facilitates uh, exploration of other website pages that is about us ngo list events page or donation page 
and about a section provides insight into the developers inspiration for creating the website and offers information about our team behind its development. The uh, events page presents comprehensive details about upcoming and past events accompanied by captivating visuals and uh, relevant information. Viewers can browse through event pictures and information if they are inclined to the support uh, to support the noble causes. This can be seen in the implementation that is in next page. This firstly, we begin with the login page where on entering our credentials, like uh, we will first create an account via signing up and which will, then it will be redirected to the login page where on entering our proper details, we will be directed to the home page of the website wherein we have this nav bar which can be used to navigate properly among uh, the other pages of the website. Uh, the events page presents these details, uh, where uh, which will also have a track of the past events, just like I mentioned. Next is the main, uh, the major highlight of our website, that is the donation page. The central feature of this, uh, this website, that is our donation page, is a housing, uh, is a user friendly donation form where individuals are invited to provide their relevant details. The user can select the appropriate NGOs via a drop down list and they can directly pay via the QR code as shown in the figure. Uh, once completed, the donation amount is securely transferred to the respective NGO's account through the website. Now to keep the uh, donors to be motivated to donate uh, again and again or to donate generously, we have this leaderboard page wherein uh, the, all uh, the top uh, donors would be uh, seen in the form in the form of a table. Here we can see that there, there are just five entries, but there are more than five entries in the table, wherein uh, people can check who is in the top and who is at the bottom. So this page is actually designed to, um, to motivate the donors. The highest contributor is awarded the privilege of being chief guest at the upcoming events. Moreover, the website offers separate web pages for each NGO. Uh, seamlessly connected to the NGO list. Each NGO page provides relevant information, like mentioned here. This is the information regarding the NGO page with the NGO name at the at the top, and uh, there is the donate button. Where on clicking on this button, it, the user will be directly redirected to the donation page. The NGO pages also feature a map location highlighting the geographical position of the of each NGO. Additionally, this, of course, the prominent donate, donate button is strategically placed throughout the website, redirecting users to the de dedication, dedicated donation page. Now, uh, in conclusion, uh, the significance of non-governmental organizations cannot be overstated as they serve as vital conducts for local communication, action and resource distribution, particularly in the absence of robust local organizations. NGOs offer a mechanism that can fill the void by the government limitations, supporting initiatives and adapting respond, uh, adeptly responding to the uh, unique needs of local communities. In this context, our website emerges as a pivotal tool, facilitating connections between individuals and these NGOs, thereby indirectly contributing to the betterment of society. Looking ahead, we envision the enhancement of the website with additional features such as community fridges, um, awareness campaigns and direct transactions between NGOs and users, eliminating the need of, for intermediaries. This evolution aims to further empower individuals to engage directly with NGOs, fostering a more immediate and impactful relationship that transcends traditional barriers. And that's it from my end. Thank you so much for giving this opportunity to me and my team. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it was nice that you have told about a website, uh, Nidhi, for NGOs. Uh, yes. So aren't there you. such websites already there for NGOs? Ma'am, there are um, private websites for each NGOs, but there are many mm -hmm. NGOs which are local and they are not having a proper reach due to lack of technology uh, of the NGO with uh, the, techno the uh, outside field. So what we had planned initially while creation of this website was to contact these NGOs to, re uh, to reach out to these NGOs, which are genuine, but uh, they don't have uh, that much promotion. So we have created separate web pages for these NGOs and have incorporated these NGOs in our comprehensive platform. Okay, so have you used any standard templates or uh, platform or you have hard coded this website. 
Ma'am, majority yeah. is hard coded because uh, we had searched for some sort of reference, but mm. uh, there was there were just private websites, so we had to okay. like come up with the structure of the website. So uh, how it's how long that you have launched this website? Ma'am, this uh, we have not launched this website okay. as of now. This is our college project which we have created. We have not like, not properly hosted because there is okay. there are several future scope. For this uh, project, which can enhance this website further. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am Nadi. I'd once again like to ask for the present presenters who uh, weren't there previously. I'm Indudin Hassan. If you're here, then you can present your paper. We have Muhammad Farhan. Ashwita K. Ma'am Annie, uh, since we do not have uh, the three presenters. Yes. Then we can conclude the meeting. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Many. I sincerely thank our authors for their excellent presentations and contribution in this session and on our participants for being a part of this international conference. I hope this session was informative enough. We, on behalf of the whole team, thank you for the support during this eighth version and the previous seven versions of the conference. We will be happy to have you in the ninth version in 2024. All the presenters will be getting their digital certificates through email within two working days. Further all, all the papers have been already forwarded to the Springer. The publication will be live within six months, so kindly cooperate with the team of ICTCS 2023. I also thank our session chair, Professor Annie Rajan, for chairing this session. A token of appreciation to the chair on behalf of Team ICTCS 2023 and Global thank Knowledge you. Research Foundation. Thank you. Thank you for your valuable presence, ma'am. Yeah, thank you. I kindly request everyone to switch on their cameras for a quick snapshot of the virtual conference. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe and take care.